as you can see here already, it's clear that Evolving Skies has a better ratio. Well, Most important thing is, past performance is not indicative of future performance. That's Hello people, your favorite European YouTuber here, and today we're going to try to debunk, go over, take a look at some numbers, some data, as well as I'll try to give you some food for thought on one of the most uh, controversial debate that is Pokemon against the stock market, against the king of the stock market, the S&P 500. So without wasting too much time, as also one of you suggested, I'll cut it short, so we'll go straight into the video. What I recommend is look at the hypothesis made, look at where the data is taken from, look at what type of data it is, as well as stay tuned for the conclusion, uh, which is a very important part of this video. So I'll try not to bore you, and that be said, let's get started. So data, where is the data coming from? So when it comes to Pokemon, and we'll see what type of Pokemon product we're gonna take a look at today, it's weekly returns. So I've taken weekly prices over one year. So we have 52 data points, obviously 52 weeks in a year, and the returns are calculated using the simplest way you can calculate a return price today minus price yesterday divided by price yesterday so obviously yesterday and today would be a week worth of data a week uh, a time span of a week so hope that's clear uh, it's not taken considering that uh, one dollar one euro today is not worth like one euro tomorrow which is what or one dollar tomorrow which is what usually is done in finance as well as uh, i as, haven't used log returns which are a very good approximation of uh, the return i just mentioned based on the properties that are associated with log. So these prices come from TG Player. So for all of you American out there, you should be finding some American data, as well as the S&P's The Spy, which is uh, an ETF on the S&P. Uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't, there's many type of ETFs, uh, depending on how they're structured. I also think there's different regulations for how you can have an ETF set up depending on the country the ETF is based on if not even the country the etf is let's say bought on so kind of marketed so if you buy it in the u against the us for instance uh, but it is uh, an etf on the s p because obviously you cannot buy directly s p yes and be just an index if you didn't know that uh, just so you can go into the market and buy the s p to, to replicate the s p you either buy all the components and you need to balance them out as time goes on which is very time consuming as well as you, you require a large sum of money unless you have fractional shares which some of brokers offer as well as uh, transaction cost would uh, dry up your uh, uh, gains if any so that being said metrics what are we going to use to compare the two returns obviously i mentioned how i'm going to calculate return volatility which is going to be our preferred measure of risk which is gonna be nothing but the standard deviation returns. That's the formula for it. So the standard deviation is nothing but the square root of variance. And uh, this right here is the data point. This right here is the sample mean, which we're gonna use the sample mean with uh, equal weights, also known as the arithmetic mean or average, call it whatever you want, you're gonna square it. And then everything you have a square root because again, it's this would be the formula, call it formula, call it whatever you want for the variance, you square you get your standard deviation. And then another metric we're gonna use, because obviously we not only care about the returns, we not only care about risk, but we want to see how the two work together. So we're gonna use uh, what I call a modified sharp ratio. Sharp ratio, if you're not aware, is the difference between the, it's called the excess return. So the return of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate, which is usually represented by the 10 year bond, US bonds uh, over the volatility of the portfolio. So we're gonna, we're just gonna consider the return of the portfolio over uh, its volatility. We're not gonna consider the excess return. So we're not gonna consider the risk-free rate. So finally, some data, right? So again, I mentioned all this data. This as everything has been done with uh, Python, which is my preferred uh, language and uh, after Italian. I'm so funny. Uh, and uh, I will I will try to leave you the, because I have um, every, all the data has been downloaded into an Excel sheet to just have it there. And then I eventually extracted it and uh, use it with Python. Uh, so I will try to leave you the sheet with all the data. And all the data, I mean the returns. Because once I have returns, I can do all this fancy stuff. 
Uh, so I will try to leave you if you guys want to play around with it. Um, I will. It will be link somewhere. Uh, I'll try to figure that out. Uh, so you find it in the description as well. You find the link to Discord, which I recommend you join. Um, so um, here simply we have the expected return. We, these are weekly expected returns with the 52 data points we have. Standard deviation, once again, weekly standard deviation. Uh, obviously, uh, standard deviation will have the same uh, measured unit of the mean. That's how it works. And we have the ratio well, that we talked about earlier. So this ratio right here returns over volatility. Uh, what we want to see here is a larger number possible. The greater this number is, the better it is. As you can see here already, it's clear that evolving skies has a better ratio. As you can see here already, it's clear that evolving skies has a better ratio. So it will provide you with the best return, which it will provide you with the best return overall. If you look at all the returns, expected returns, evolving skies will provide you with the greater return. Sorry, I said will, I meant has. Uh, we'll go over that. Um, if I say will, um, forgive me, uh, has. It's it's all past tense. Uh, it's not future tense. So evolving skies has provided us with uh, the greater return. Um, and uh, if we compare it to its risk, its volatility, once again, we find a better return to risk ratio, as you can see here. So evolving skies is mathematical wise, uh, treating these as uh, financial instruments. Uh, it's the best um, box we could have bought. Um, now, it shouldn't be surprising, but um, but easy to say after it happens, right? Um, and does that mean it's going to happen again in the future? We'll go over that uh, later on in the video. Now, this is the interesting part. So the expected portfolio return is 0.51%. Again, weekly, we're talking about weekly returns. And the setting deviation, which is going to be our volatility, is 0.2%. Now, standard deviation is not simply the average of the standard deviations. Uh, standard deviation of the portfolio also includes what is called a covariance matrix, which, for the sake of this video, I will not go over it. Uh, feel free to take uh, just Google on, uh, you know, covariance matrix. You'll find a uh, Ask ChatGPT. You'll find plenty of financial literature if you're interested. It also takes into consideration the covariance. So basically, in not mathematical terms, and let's say in English. Um, it takes into consideration how all the sets of booster, these are booster boxes, by the way, uh, as, as written here, all of these booster boxes it, um, are not correlated, but how, how the standard deviation uh, correlates, kind of, uh, again, uh, this is not mathematical terms, it's English. So that is something that I want you to notice. And uh, as you can see, it's pretty interesting because this ratio, as we'll see, it's pretty interesting. It's above one, right? Whereas here, all the ratio was below one. So how is that possible? That here, none of the ratio is above one, but here it is. It's actually above two. Moving on to elite trainer boxes, as you can see, same thing, same data, same process, same thing. Again, once again, same deviation, same process with the covariance matrix, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're, the portfolio is basically we're buying one of each right uh, and this is really data so we're buying it a uh, year one year back from today so july 13th 2023 uh, we're buying one of each and that's this is what would have happened this is not what is going to happen this is what would have happened um, and once again the best performing etbs uh has been evolving skies the worst performing one um, has been chilling rain closely followed by rebel clash and uh, the most volatile uh, would have been involved in skies and uh, once again obviously when it comes to uh, risk or uh, return to risk actually the best one would have been fusion strike as you can see here so these numbers and uh, once again uh, you'll obviously take a look a uh, closer look if you want just by pausing or whatever uh, i'll provide you with uh, these slides on the discord so if you want to join feel free i will provide you with uh, this uh, presentation if you want something uh, you press want to take a, a closer look at it or if you have any questions about all the math behind it i'm very happy to i'm very happy to to answer questions about maths um so here the s p so simply yeah these again weekly returns i talked about it average weekly return for the s p over the past year has been 0.46 percent standard deviation has been 1.6 percent 
So it's easy to see that the standard deviation, the S&P, experienced the most volatility, the most risk, the most standard deviation. They're all synonymous. Booster boxes have outperformed both the S&P and ETBs, right? Only when it comes to returns, right? If we take a look at returns, booster boxes, the portfolio for booster boxes, 0.51% weekly returns, ETBs 0.15% and 0.46. So the S&P was close to booster boxes, but booster boxes have outperformed. Not will, but they have. ETBs were the least performing assets. What about risk? Which one was the one with the less risk? 1.61, the S&P was the one that carried the most risk based on how we define risk, standard deviation. And then ETBs 0.20% and booster boxes were the one with less risk, 0.2%. Now, risk to reward, as you can see here, once again, booster boxes, the best performing one, followed by ETB and now the S&P. So previously, if we didn't continue to risk, the S&P was second to the booster boxes when it, come, when it came to return. Right now, if we also consider risk, the S&P is the least performing one, has been the least performing ones when we take this metric, reward to risk, the mod, what I call the modified sharp ratio, as you can see here in this slide. Now, that's the data that I presented to you. Now, let's develop some thoughts on this data, right? Um, so, one thing that should have been expected is this, the fact that the S&P have had the largest volatility. Should we have expected that? Like, would you have said that, well, a Pokemon portfolio has a lower volatility, which is how we measure risk, so lower risk than the stock market using the S&P? Well, despite the fact that the S&P is a conglomerate of stocks, companies, this could have been expected. If you have a portfolio, the scope of having a portfolio is diversification. What will diversification bring you? It will decrease your expected return as well as your volatility. So you will have to sacrifice expected performance to obtain a more stable or less volatile portfolio. As you can see here, if we only take a look, let's say, let's use booster boxes for this example. If you only take a look at booster boxes right here, as we mentioned previously, Evolving Skies booster box had a volatility of 2.52%, right? Which is higher than the S&P 1.6. So if you only take one asset right here, and that's Evolving Skies, it's not even the most volatile one, because the most volatile one, as you can see, has been lost origin over the past year. Evolving Skies is more volatile then the S&P has been more volatile. This comes down to the math behind how you calculate the portfolio standard deviation, your portfolio volatility. That's where it's all about. Hence, what we should expect is if we combine the S&P to other assets. So even if you combine the S&P with your portfolio, your, your booster box portfolio, you should expect a lower volatility than one of the two. So in this case, the one with the higher volatility would have been the S&P. If you combine the two, you should expect a lower volatility than the one with only the S&P. That's just math. Uh, it's math analytically proven that's how it works. That's why the S&P has a high volatility. It doesn't mean that Pokemon is less risky. It just means that once you construct a portfolio, that portfolio, that's how it perform. It, it should have been expected that the volatility associated with that portfolio was lower than the one with a portfolio constructed by only one asset, the S&P. Doesn't mean that Pokemon is less risky. It just means that if you construct a diversified portfolio, then you should expect a lower volatility. If I, again, if I were to do the same with uh, stocks, so a bunch of stocks, then that's what I should expect. I should expect a lower volatility of that portfolio constructed by different stocks than just the volatility of, let's say, Apple. That's just, that's why diversification exists. That's why all you use here is diversify, diversify, because it will decrease your volatility, your standard deviation.
But as you can see, you will have to sacrifice expected returns. If you all invested in Volvi Skies, your expected return would have been 1.15% against a 0.51% uh, with your booster boxes portfolio. So you need to make sacrifices. And obviously, it's, it's you know this is historical data. It doesn't mean that uh, Volvi Sky is going to perform the same. It has, right? So even so, if right now you were to buy only Volvi Sky booster boxes, you'll be exposed to the risk that you sh center deviation is going to be higher than if you were to buy all these solar initial sets. That's a certainty. And you don't know if the expected return is going to be higher than the one of your portfolio. Because as you can see here, reduction of blaze, you had a lower expected return than the ones with your portfolio. Now, a year from now, that's what could happen with the Wolven Skies. That's how it works. Now, that being said, a few other things I want to point out, and it's not all roses and flowers. Why? Well, most important thing is past performance is not indicative of future performance. That's why I said this data has provided us, has, I was talking the past tense. The fact that these things happen doesn't mean they're going to happen again in the future. Now, why, why is that so? Well, first of all, you cannot um, precisely uh, with 100% certainty forecast the future. Anyone then say, um, you know, booster boxes will go up. It will, it will. <sighs> Uh, it's 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 a risky to say. Even though at the then at, you know at the in the description of your video you say no financial advice, or you say in your video it's not financial advice, saying that it's a bit misleading. You don't know if you will. If it, if you knew, then you would buy um, all of it. You you put as much money as you have in that. If you know it will go up, right? So a problem that so one of the reasons why you cannot use these as predictor methods is the lack of sufficient data. Um, there are studies, I'm not going to go over into them, uh, if you, you will need a much larger number of data points to, um, let's say, not know data is going to be indicative of future performance, but to have a better reliability on your data, as well as the, uh, let's say, instruments we use, such as the, the type of expected return, as well as covariance matrix we used. Um, it's one of the weakest when it comes to predicting future results. Uh, once again, this is complex math. I will not go into it, but be aware that's one of the problems. Another one, obviously, when it comes to a specific Pokemon against uh, the stock market is or are transaction costs. We know that buying a share of an S&P fund is going to be uh, much more efficient when it comes to transaction costs than by 12 booster boxes. Scalability, uh, you cannot put millions into this. Uh, obviously, if you watch me, you will most likely not have millions to put into Pokemon. Uh, I can give you that, but it, it is one of the problems. And then obviously liquidity, everyone talks about it. You can say, yes, Pokemon sells. Absolutely, everything sells for the right price, uh, but it's not as selected as stocks. If you, if you, you know, if you're on this other side and keep saying, oh, well, this stuff is liquid, uh, and you keep denying the fact that uh, shares are more liquid, then you're just lying to yourselves. I can sell, you can sell millions worth of shares in a few seconds, or minutes at, at most. And then last but not least, uh, taking booster boxes and ATBs, it's kind of, and comparing them to the S&P, which is something you can do, uh, it's not really taking like a Pokemon as a whole. If you can you can compare Pokemon to the stock market, so you can make a fair comparison of you know having Pokemon. So you take a uh, few products from the TCG, a few products from merchandise, a few products from video games. You construct a basket of these, and then you compare to the to the stock market. So the S and P, but you know specifically picking booster boxes, specifically picking like we did Soul and Shield. Um, and then choose your time f window, it's kind of cheating. It's like saying, okay, well, let's compare the S&P to NVIDIA, right? So obviously what we did here was only for entertaining purposes, as well as maybe making you aware that you can do this kind of stuff. Uh, it's possible. I've did it. You can do it. But obviously this has no uh, meaning when it comes to predicting future prices, at least the way we did it. As I mentioned previously, there's other way you can do it, which becomes much more liable. But again, that is much more complex than what we went over in today's 
video. So everyone that keeps saying, oh, look at this, look at this data, this data, this is facts, you cannot deny that, you should buy this, that's why you should invest in Pokemon, because it beats the S&P. Well, he has. Will it? Will it continue this way? And are you making a fair comparison by choosing booster boxes against an index about the 500 largest company in the United States of America? And are you making a fair comparison saying to your viewers that past data is indicative of future performance? As well, are you being fair when you don't mention scalability, transaction cost, and liquidity? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.